and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have Kathy Kim. She's a family physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, Fascia in Primary Care When Chest Pain is Not in Your Chest. Kathy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and your journey to where you are today? Uh, several years ago, I had an injury that had a lot of consequences after, a lot of pain and things that weren't explained by my original injury, which was a fracture. So I used that as an opportunity to explore alternative uh, ways of, uh, of treating it because I already, after 20 plus years in primary care, I already knew all the options and I wasn't really excited about them, to be honest. So, so I saw, you know, I sought chiropractic, sports chiropractic care acupuncture, uh, and uh, including myofascial physical therapy. And I was, I was just amazed at how fast the function could return when you targeted the correct mechanical problem. And I, uh, so since I was really much more symptomatic than most patients, uh, as I was doing my primary care, well, woman exam, any kind of visit, people would bring up these things uh, these complaints. And I would say, well, let's try this because I know it worked. I understand how it works. So how about we try this? And it's an amazing point to have this option of uh, offering that to patients instead of writing prescriptions mm -hmm. and having them walk out still in as much pain as they came in with. You know, I always, always a big listener to my patients. So they might come out a less burdened or more validated, but to actually have them walk out feeling better physically, that was a, a great gift I could give, a great a reward in, in uh, practice that I had never had before. So it just grew to be a more complex kind of interactions with patients. And so this article, the chest pain article, was the beginning of my blog article series to show how you could use this, how it applies to primary care. And that is not always just for athletes or people with mechanical injuries like knee pain, you know, things that you would tend to think are more like in the realm of straight kind of specialty medicine. So um, anyway, that's how I came to this area and then experiencing what fascia was and kind of understanding it that it's new. It's like new mm -hmm. frontier, right? So I looked into how many books were written about fascia from 2000 to 2010. It's only about seven and it's about 30 mm -hmm. since 2010. So it's exploding as an area and especially since um, 2018 when some uh, work was published about it possibly being an organ in and of itself, which then uh, really then affects every specialty because, you know, then it's like if it's an organ of itself mm -hmm. in the whole body, then it could restructure how you're thinking about anything, any disease process. What exactly is the type of medicine that, that you're practicing as it relates to the fascia? And can you tell me a little more detail exactly what you do? learning about working with people and with these problems that I would find among them being that chest pain case that I wrote about. I learned, I went to functional medicine conference and I thought, oh, wow, this is true. This root cause mm -hmm. of going to what that is. And when we give people Prilosec, is that really helping their root cause of why they have this symptom, right? Uh, that always actually had bothered me even in medical school that mm -hmm. I didn't understand how that was helping the the root cause. So probably philosophically, I was much more aligned with that from the beginning. And I was very mechanical minded, even when I did prenatal care, like when sure. the woman would complain about something, I would think about the mechanics of the pregnancy that where it sat and what, what symptoms she was having. So functional medicine was a good match for my uh, inherent philosophy. It, it relies a lot on like nutrition and the biochemistry aspect. And so I I feel that I've, um, so what's uh, slightly different about what I'm doing as the root cause is I look at the root cause mechanics, structural mm -hmm. mechanics of why someone would have something. So if, for instance, if someone has their torso is way in front of their hips, then you can have them pursue an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle. There will be a limit to how much you are going to help impact their, uh, the impact of gravity mm -hmm. on the, on the off balance that they have. So anyway, so that's what I, um, so that's how I'm slightly different because I balance both of those. 
So let's transition into your Kevin MD article. And I think it's going to give my audience uh, a fuller picture of what you do in the exam room. So you wrote this case, fashion primary care when chest pain is not in your chest. Now, for those who haven't read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and explain why you decided to share this particular case? I thought this case was a, a good illustration of like m what uh, it kind of encapsulates the trepidation and the thought process of what happens when you are conventionally trained, traditionally trained as an allopathic physician, medical doctor, which is not very experiential. You know, everything is like wrote through mm -hmm. sitting in lectures. And so you don't really do a lot of hands on except, you know, maybe when you do venipuncture on your classmates, you know, like that. So I thought that this was momentous in terms of like chest pain has a lot of uh, chest pain where it's the heart, it's the lung, it's really like a, um, we take it very seriously. So to take this uh, approach that I had and kind of make and look at all his data by numbers, this man should have really nothing really seriously wrong with his heart and his lungs, yet he could not walk a block or around the block. It's basically like kind of a just uh, like what that's what I go through with uh, different kinds of patients because they might come to me and then they, they have nowhere else to go. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of people who are doing fascia work, a lot of these books, these people are anatomists or body workers and not and maybe orthopedists. But because I've been a primary care doctor all the way from prenatal care all the way to the elderly population, you know how when you're in a lecture and you're at a conference and you learn something new and then all of a sudden you think of three patients and mm -hmm. how that matches that. So imagine all the light bulbs that go off for me when I figure out something or I feel, see it in a patient and it reminds me of the pregnant woman and, and at the same time an adult and all of those. So I have light bulbs like that going off all the time. So the synthesis of all of that while I while I put together the mechanics to see how that if I release the right places, could this man's chest pain be improved? Because I did not have, a, based on my experience, I did not think that referring him once again somewhere else mm -hmm. was going to give him a lot, especially when he had, had had to stop working. So there's a lot riding on that for him. Mm -hmm. Now, what kind of modalities did you do in this particular case to help him with his fascial pain? I didn't know his fascial pain, but I was trying to understand, like, based on a careful history, because, you know, they always teach us in, in medicine that it's the patient had the details mm -hmm. are in the history. And, um, and so we, if you're skilled at listening, you can pick out the parts where, where uh, that make a difference. So when I listened to his story and wh how that bothered him and details of, of, his, of what was happening, I thought, okay it seems, you know, really a uh, movement and how can I help him with that? So I would have to say that in like a kind of a scrappy engineer way, you know how someone is like, can just make something out of things at home and use, you know, little sticks and that. I, I just made up uh, what also was worked on, how it was worked on me. Cause I realized when uh, I was worked on, PVC pipe was used, elbows were used, hand pressure was used. So I, it depended on the area, what was useful, what I could do there. So if it was his, around his rib cage, I used my elbow, elbow mostly. But at that time I was just starting out. So I really didn't use anything more than just my hands and my and pressure and my elbows in the attempt to uh, loosen these fascial layers that had uh, become adherent to each other, you know. So anyway, so that is what I did. And uh, because it was new, I, I didn't want to go all in, hurt him a lot. So mm -hmm. I did it kind of like just as a, a little light test everywhere. And as long as he was okay with it, we kept going because he kind of also knew that he couldn't work and he was willing to try. I cannot tell you how meaningful that that patient visit was in a busy primary care day mm -hmm. where, you know, you're scheduled every 20 minutes and you see this person and they have so much riding on the fact that they can't work and they're looking for help. And um, so you're doing this on the spot experiment by the seat of your pants mm -hmm. and trying to make sure that you're also riding the line of like really in their best interest and you're not hurting them and checking in. So it is, it's, uncharted territory, which in this age of like GPS and satellite technology, you almost never are in uncharted territory. But mm -hmm. this was this was truly uncharted because it's not like I have a mentor for that or anything because 
um, in this work. And so that was amazing to have him explain to me when you're just suspensefully waiting and hearing him say that he's, he's crying because he's so happy. Mm-hmm. I mean, from months of having this disability, really, sure. right, with no hope. So yeah, that, that, so it was, it's like, I'm an explorer and scientist and all that at the same time, working on someone, you know, just, we're just trying, we're going to try to figure it out. And for clinicians who are interested in exploring more about what you do, is there a fellowship or a training course or any books or online resources you can recommend? I have read a lot of books. You could see the stack I have read to look for the understanding of it more. And it's done at such a mechanical level, you know, mechanical level direct, like um, by in terms of anatomy, it's that I'm interested in the clinical application of it for a primary care problem that you would not really maybe think is straightforward. So uh, I, I am working on developing. That's what why I have blog articles in my mm-hmm. series when I first wrote this was the first one mm-hmm. to introduce that this is how it came into my using it for primary care. It doesn't say it's for pain and injury. It's for things that you do encounter that are unsolvable in primary care. So I, I would say I'm interested in that. There are other workshops. I have found them more geared towards uh, it seems to me body workers, people who are in sports, who are going to help people with hip pain and those kinds of things. My root cause approach in functional medicine, because it's not just that I guide about anti-inflammatory diet and anti-inflammatory lifestyle. My perspective is that the two biggest problems that we are having in our modern society is we're having inflammation from the, from the chronic exposure to all these um, newer pesticides and mm-hmm. non-diverse diet. And we're having inflexibility because in our modern lifestyle, we move less. And so I'm looking at what are the key things that we are losing in this modern way of living? No squat toilets, Mm -hmm. you know, all modern chairs. You see how that restricts the hip and so much. And that's like a perpetual motion engine that's driving the rest of the stiffness. So I'd say that's how I do both, that it's structural, structural inflexibility and Mm -hmm. A lifestyle inflammation. Those that's in in that way, and so I offer that, and I'm developing that for, uh, for helping prime other interested primary care people who think that way to, to uh, work on these things. So. We're talking to Kathy Kim. She's a family physician, and she wrote the Kevin MD article: Fascia and Primary Care When Chest Pain Is Not in Your Chest. Kathy, you mentioned several times about an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. Can you explain what that is and what are some changes patients can do to reduce inflammation? Sure. So I've given some lectures on this. And actually, I was prepared to give one at the beginning of the pandemic, which we had to cancel. I explain inflammation is an, uh, is a basically an event that disrupts the body's normal routine of doing things. And if you want to understand it uh, analogously to the world, it'd be like hurricane coming through. So a hurricane comes through, disrupts everything, floods everything, and we go to kind of like a survival mode until we can get everything back what people misunderstand about when they get exposed to these kinds of things that make us inflamed, like pesticides, for instance, you know, that is on everything, or Mm -hmm. even this uh, glyphosate, which is Roundup used on a lot of grain crops, that's all being fed to the animals, and then we ingest that through there, right? So there's all these sources through the processing and industrialization of agriculture and mm-hmm. and preparation of our food. And never mind in our medicines because they add the colors and those are artificial petroleum based often, right? So all of these things disrupt us. And even if they're natural, for instance, in my lecture, I mentioned about how you can have like a seaweed extract added. That's natural. Except if you ate the seaweed, like we would eat, and you're getting a, a tiny smidgen of that. Mm-hmm. But when you kind of extract it and then add it to texture, then you're getting at an amount that's inflammatory. So that's disruptive to your body. So my point to people is that is uh, to try to help them understand inflammation, which mm-hmm. stress causes inflammation, all these kind of imba- uh, all these chemicals, foreign things are causing inflammation that these are so disruptive that you need time to recover so you can get more of your regular routine restored. And inflammation is like mud. 
-hmm. And if you looked at inflammatory things that you take into your body as like creating this hurricane and then mud, which needs to dry out, then you would really understand how you need to tilt everything way towards having a lot more sunshine mm -hmm. and less often the hurricane thing. So that is, um, that's how I help people understand what they, what they need to do. And so that ties into diversity of eating because when you diversify your food then your diversity of your microbiome in your gut is better your mm -hmm. gut your immune system in your gut and then you can have when that's more stable and healthy the rest of your body will will follow as long as now as i can help you also be more structurally sound so that you are not trying to hoist all your uh, your head up uh, uh, the direction that it's actually pitching you know so that's how that matters and my final question, Kathy, what is your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin and the audience? Diversity is probably the key word that uh, ties the problem of inflammation and inflexibility. We're losing diversity in our uh, food intake for the natural healing powers of all the diversity of what we could have taken in. So uh, that, that contributes to inflammation and we're losing diversity in our movements mm -hmm. uh, as we sp specialize in these jobs. And um, so there's, you know, uh, and even not even looking up, for instance, for the weather anymore, because people look down at their phone or their Apple watch instead of up at the sky. So we are losing this diversity of of diet and movement, and this results in inflammation and inflexibility, which is, I feel, the, uh, the root cause for many of the, of the illnesses and ailments that we're taking care of. So if you can improve that, then you will, uh, in a meaningful way, lasting way, then you improve your well-being. Kathy, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight, and thanks again for being on the show. Hey, thank you.